The year is 1929. It's the end of the Roaring Twenties and the beginning of the Great Depression. The 31st President of the United States is sworn in. And the U.S. population is nearly 122 million. And on January 15th, exactly 94 years to date, in the segregated city of Atlanta, Martin Luther King Jr. is born. From child prodigy to the leader of the American Civil Rights Movement, his personal ancestry was anchored deep in faith, activism, and love. Those same roots would be the foundational strength needed to take on the consciousness of America. He fought hate with love and darkness with light. It was his trademark for hope and a radical approach that would inspire monumental change. These revolutionary values had him arrested over 29 times for peaceful marches and protests, seeking equality and human rights for African Americans, the economically disadvantaged, and all victims of injustice. Many crowning accomplishments gained through his suffering, sacrifice, service, and convictions. Write the powerful pages of history and the pages still yet to be written. Eastern Hills, uh, this weekend, we remember Martin Luther King Jr. and the fight for civil rights. Um, you know, he encouraged and challenged us to love our neighbor as ourselves. And, you know, we believe that everyone was created with equal dignity, value, and worth. And so uh, today, we honor our differences and continue to be a community that is for people. You know, we are so excited that you are all here today. It's gonna to be a great weekend. It's a really special one that we're gonna talk about here in a second. But if you're new, we wanna say welcome to you and we would love to help you get connected. You can stop by Guest Central out in the lobby right after the service. And what you can do is right now you can take out your phone and you can scan that QR code right up on the screen or text the word new to the number up there. And we will get back in touch with you and help you find your next step. When you stop at Guest Central out in the lobby, we also have a special gift for you. Well, Eastern Hills, you know, in this last year, there has been a lot to celebrate. Um, you guys have stepped up in ways that we could not imagine. Uh, you have served and you have gave and you have just been an amazing place to continue to be for our community. And we just wanna say thank you for the ways that you continue to be a generous group of people. And we would love for you to partner with us, not only in the things that are going on right now, but also in the things to come in the next season as well. So if you'd like to know more, you can go to ehills.org slash weekend and click the give button there. Okay, you guys ready? Uh, today is a day we've been waiting for for a long time. And I've been standing up here over the last year giving you guys updates about a lead pastor transition. And the day is finally here. But before you get too excited, I've got a couple of things to let you know. The first is just a little bit more uh, personal because if you see Kendall over there with his head down, he's not sad. He just had eye surgery yesterday. So he has to keep his head down like this. So just know that he is excited and is here because he was not about to miss today as well. Well, he is so glad to be here. Um, but here's the thing. Next weekend, we are going to continue our celebration. We are going to have a special time at the end of the service when the elders come up and pray over Tom and Jess and the boys and this next season here. Then we're going to uh, head out to the lobby and we're going to have a, a welcome reception out there next weekend as well. So we want to invite you back to continue this new season with us next week. You know, but before we uh, get on to this next part, uh, we want to stop and we want to pause and say thank you to Jesus for the way that he has been faithful in this season. So would you bow your heads and pray with me? God, we are um, so just amazed at the way that you have worked in this last year. God, we thank you for your faithfulness, um, not just in the last year, but over the many, many years here at Eastern Hills and the shoulders that we stand on and the people that have set the foundation here. God, and we also look forward to the ways that we know that you are going to move in the future. 
God, we thank you for the way that you orchestrated details and cared about those things for us as a church and also for the Bassan family. God, we just pray for them in this season. We pray for Tom and Jess and Will and Luke. God, that you would continue to be with them as this transition still continues in this season. God, we just love you so much and we are so thankful for the way that you have been so faithful to us. Thank you, thank you, thank you. In Jesus' name, amen. Okay, Eastern Hills, let's get ready. Get on your feet and give a warm welcome to Tom. I don't know why you guys are clapping. I haven't done anything yet. <laughs> this could be a terrible sermon, so. I cried like a baby in the first service. I said I wasn't gonna do it again, but just bear with me. It's an emotional day. Um, just to finally be here, to have the privilege of speaking to you today. I don't take it lightly. And I want you to know, E. Hills, that Jess and I and our family, we are incredibly grateful, we are incredibly expectant, and we are humbled. And so I wanna say first and foremost, thank you, E. Hills, for the way that you have welcomed us, you have embraced us, you have just, just gone so far above and beyond, we're just so overwhelmed. I think of the, the elders, I think of the search team, and to Rob, part of the Agora search team, just incredible people who've helped us to, to get here. And of course, as we've just prayed to, to God, to Jesus, I wanna say thank you. I wanna say, I wanna remind you, you are good. Thank you, Father. You are faithful and your church is alive. I promise you, your church is alive. You know, for much of my life uh, growing up, I did not actually believe that. I thought that Christianity was outdated, it was irrelevant. I just couldn't see how someone who lived 2,000 years ago, 7,000 miles away, could have any real relevance in my life. Do you see how I'm already using miles? Oh, fancy, no more kilometers. Okay, but, <laughs> and when I looked at the church, to be honest, I thought church was boring, and Christians, well, Christians were just kinda weird. <laughs> And that is still true, but, but, and maybe you're here, maybe someone dragged you here to hear the South African guy or whatever, you, you don't normally come to church. I wanna say, if, if that's you, if you still see the church like that or Christians like that, I wanna say welcome. I wanna say, I hope that you feel at home here. We're so glad that you're here. When I look back on my own story on that time in my life, uh, there was definitely something missing in my life. You know, from an external perspective, a worldly perspective, things were going great at the time. I was a, an accomplished athlete and, and I, I was acing my studies at college at the time. I was popular, I had money, I had friends, you know, everything was going well. But every time I achieved something, that feeling, it just never lasted. And eventually I got to the point where I was like, there's gotta be more to life than this, right? I, I guess you could say that I was longing for more. Say more. more. I don't know if you guys are like the talk back thing. My wife is like shaking her head, like don't do that, Tom. Um, <laughs> and maybe you're here thinking, oh, I hope he's not one of those pastors. But the actor Jim Carrey once said this. He says, I wish everyone could get rich and famous and have everything they've ever dreamed of so that they would know that's not the answer. Some people dream of having their name in light. Some people dream of finding happiness through relationships or career or success or money or whatever. And none of those things on their own are bad things, right? But do you ever get that niggly feeling in the depths of your being that there must be more? E. Hills, you know this already, but too often life doesn't turn out the way we think it should or hoped it would. Anybody? <laughs> And even if it does, and even if we achieve our wildest dreams, somehow it's never quite enough. The comedian and actor Russell Brand said this. He said, drugs and alcohol are not my problem. Reality is my problem. Drugs and alcohol are my solution to fill up the hole inside of me. And we all have a hole inside of us and not enough. 
And, and, and I'm not talking here about not enough stuff or not enough money. You guys have got Amazon Prime. Unbelievable. <laughs> I mean, you order it, it's there the next day. I, I, anyway, it's dangerous. But I'm not talking about not enough stuff. I'm talking about not enough time. Not enough energy, not enough patience, not enough good people in the world, not enough kindness to go around, not enough community, not enough unity, not enough joy in our relationships. Anyone? Not enough peace in my home. Amen. (laughs) I mean, my kids have been out of school now for over a month. (laughs) And oh, am I ready for them to start school in America? I mean, come on, Jesus, take them now. You know what I mean? (laughs) Cherry Creek School District, have them, please, okay. (laughs) Now, maybe you feel like you are not enough. Not a good enough parent, not a good enough student, not a good enough sister, not a good enough employee, not, not smart enough, not skinny enough, not enough. And what that leads to is what if, what if I can't get out of debt? What if I'm not good enough for this role? What if... You know, what if I'm not brave or strong enough to fight this cancer? What if? Guys, I have to be honest with you. This has been us. This has been me for the past four months. I mean, when I heard the announcement that you guys made back here in August about us coming over and joining the E-Heels team, and we were so excited. And, and like I said, we're, we're humbled and we're grateful to God. And, and Jess and I, we just knew, as we know now, like never before, that this is just a calling of God in our lives. There's no other way to put it. Like we've never known anything before. But at the same time, if I'm just being real with you, there was a part of me that was also petrified, is petrified. (laughs) Like even as I stand up here, you know, when Jonathan announced it from the search committee, when he announced it in that August, he said this, and we were watching online, he said, Tom is a world-class communicator. (laughs) How's my American accent there? Um, Sorry, Jonathan. Um, But as he said that, Jess and I were watching, we looked at each other and were like, Am I? Like, like, I hope I am, but what if I'm not? What if I'm not good enough? What if I don't have what it takes? What if I mess this up completely and disappoint thousands of you awesome people? It's a possibility. <laughs> Seriously, I'm not that great. Ask my wife, okay? And also, I have a funny accent. Some of the people in the first service were like, I didn't know what you were saying there. And, and I've, I've, I'm pretty sure I've nearly knocked over like two people already driving on the wrong side of the road. Anyway... <laughs> I'm like, Romani, right is right, right is right. Jess keeps getting in the wrong side of the car and then having to like shuffle over. Anyway, (laughs) the truth is I am going to disappoint you. I am, that's just how it is. I'm just human. Watch, I'll do it right now. Are you ready? You ready to be disappointed? Okay, here it is. I have an Android phone. (laughs) There's some Android. Okay, okay, I see you, I see you. Some of you are like, that's it. How do we get out of here? I'm out of this church. I'm leaving this church. That's it. Get behind me, you green bubble devil. You know what I mean? <laughs> I get it. I get it. It, it makes sense. But, and, and I joke about this, and I don't, know, I don't know where you feel like you're not enough or what challenges lie in front of you, what you're dealing with, the struggles. I don't know what hunger you have inside for more, but God does. <laughs> And if that's how how you feel, that's how you've come through the doors this morning, I wanna know, I want you to know that God, I believe God has good news for you. In fact, I believe he has great news. I believe that God wants to breathe life and hope back into your soul today by reminding you of an event, by reminding you of a story, an event that took place on the side of a hill on the side of the Sea of Galilee. It's the story of Jesus feeding the 5,000. It's a story of not enough becoming more than enough. It's a story that perhaps you're familiar with, perhaps not. A story that is recorded in all four of the gospel accounts, each giving us a different angle on who Jesus is and what he's like and what he does. Because how many of you know that as we go through life, we see Jesus through different angles, right? We see God through different angles and it opens our understanding of who he is. Yes, God doesn't change, but the way we see him must change. It must grow, it must expand. I mean, if we still see God from the same point of view that we saw when we were 14 and now we're 41, well then something's missing, right? So let's dive into the story as recorded in Dr. Luke's gospel, starting in chapter nine, and it says this, and I'm gonna be reading, but it'll be uh, on the screens behind me. It says this, when the day began to wear away, 
The twelve came and said to him, send the multitude away that they may go into the surrounding towns and country and lodge and get provisions for we are in a deserted place. I don't know how many of you feel like you're in a deserted place right now, in a deserted season. And maybe God is speaking to you. But Jesus said to them, you give them something to eat. One of his disciples Andrew, the brother of Simon Peter, said to him, there is a boy who has five barley loaves and two fish, but what good are these amongst so many? In other words, there's not enough, for there were 5,000 men. Now, just a note here, uh, you may or may not know this, but that's the way Jewish cultures counted crowds. They, they counted families, in particular heads of household or husbands. And so with wives and children, there were probably an estimated 20,000 people on that hill that day. In fact, most theologians believe that was, this was the largest crowd that Jesus ever spoke to, even more so than the Sermon on the Mount. And Jesus said to them, make them sit down in groups of 50. And they did so and made them all sit down. And then he took the five loaves and the two fish, and looking up to heaven, he blessed and broke them and gave them to his disciples to set before the multitude. And then we see the miracle take place. So they all ate and were filled, all 20,000 of them, and 12 baskets of leftover fragments were taken up by them. More than enough. How many baskets? 12. Why 12? Well, I don't know exactly, but 12 is a significant number in the scriptures. 12 tribes of Israel, 12 disciples, 12 legions. Personally, I I think it was because Jesus wanted every one of the disciples to have his very own doggy bag. (laughs) Right? Do you guys say doggy bag? Or is that like takeout box? I don't know (laughs) what it is. You have such big portions, you'll need a takeout box. Anyway, but I think Jesus wanted every one of the disciples to have their basket of their own as a reminder of the proof of the miracle in their hands. It's like Jesus is saying, hey, you thought that there wasn't gonna be enough, but with me, there is always enough. That's the story. Now, now, maybe you've heard that story before, but because some of us, we've heard it so many times, or we've, I've preached this before, and maybe you've heard other preachers preach it, I think sometimes in order to really grasp the magnitude of what Jesus is trying to teach us, trying to show us in our lives, sometimes we have to put ourselves into the story, right? And so if you just kind of come with me on a bit of a thought experiment, just imagine for a moment what it must have been like to be a disciple in that moment, Imagine you are a disciple, you've been with Jesus, you've walked with Jesus, now you've gone with him across the Sea of Galilee, and at about 11 a.m. in the morning, Jesus starts to preach. And man, he's preaching. 12 o'clock comes round, he's still preaching. One o'clock, I mean, this is like an African church service. I mean, this is, you know what I mean, this is hours. Two o'clock, you guys are lucky, we preach like 30, 35 minutes here, you know what I mean? Three o'clock, you've already missed the Broncos game. I mean, I just made that, I don't know what it is, but um, (laughs) football, that's like the funny shaped ball that it's mainly you play with your hands, but you call it foot. Anyway, it's confusing. Um, (laughs) Three o'clock, four o'clock, five o'clock, six o'clock. I'm not exaggerating. Verse 12 says, when the day began to wear away. (laughs) In the Greek, that means when the day began to wear away. (laughs) Some versions say, when the hour had passed. In other words, it's too late now. Ever said that to God? It's too late now. Maybe that's how you feel. It's too late. He'll never listen. She'll never change. He'll never come to church. They're too far gone. Our marriage is over. There's no hope. Back to the story. It's getting late. Now you're a disciple. What do you do? I heard a pastor preach about this and I thought it was so funny. He said, I think the disciples formed a committee because that's what we like to do, right? The disciples, hey guys, let's huddle up here. I mean, what are we gonna do about this? Jesus just doesn't seem like he's ever gonna land this plane. I mean, I'm starving. I don't know about you guys. And I reckon one of the other disciples says, hey, let's tell him the people are hungry because he seems to care a lot about the people, you know. 
And so you get elected, imagine, you get elected to be the spokesperson to now go tell Jesus. So he's, now you've got to interrupt Jesus in the middle of his sermon. <clears throat> Excuse me, Lord. <clears throat> just, uh, just quick, uh, if you don't mind, just a, a couple of the guys and I, we've been kind of talking. And, and, um, oh, and just by the way, this whole like sermon thing, unbelievable. Love it. The way you're bringing six-week sermon series into the one day, more Jesus, you know what I mean? And, and, and the guys and I, I mean, we could keep going, we can go all night, but the people, maybe you should dismiss the people so they can go into town to get something to eat. And Jesus is like, oh, so you're concerned about the people, are you? <laughs> well, why don't you give them something to eat? Sure, that shut them up, you know what I mean? Now you gotta go back and report back to the committee. Did you tell him, did you tell him? Yeah, I told him. What did he say? He said, we gotta feed him. What do you mean we gotta feed him? All we've got is this little lunch, you know, this little boy's lunch snack, you know, five loaves, two fishes. What, that, that's not gonna be enough. Tell Jesus this is all we got, and then he'll dismiss the people. So now you go back to Jesus. Uh, Lord, um, so the guys and I, we, we kind of, um, we've been working on that whole, you know, we give them something to eat thing. And um, the problem is, we've only got five loaves and two fish. So you can go ahead and dismiss the people, you know, so we can get. And Jesus says, have them sit down in groups of 50. <laughs> now, again, we skip over that line when we read the story, but you gotta imagine yourself there. Have you ever tried to arrange 20,000 people into groups of 50? <laughs> I mean, that's not an easy thing to do. People are, you know, have you ever worked with people? <laughs> um, people are hard to work with, but somehow they manage to kind of get it done. And they divide out into groups of 50. And then we get back to the text. And Jesus says this, then he took the five loaves and the two fish and looking up to heaven, he blessed and broke them and gave them to the disciples to set before the multitude. And that all sounds wonderful. But again, imagine yourself in the moment. Jesus has blessed the bread. He's broken the, the five loaves into two, you know, and, and actually, actually there's only four and a half loaves because Peter had, anyway. But um, <laughs> this is the crazy part. Is now the, the, the magnitude, the multitude hasn't actually been, it hasn't been uh, multiplied yet. You just got five loaves, you've broken it up. Now you gotta go to the first person. What do you do? Just take a small piece. <laughs> I mean, that must have been pretty awkward. What do you say? But then the miracle happened. And so and then, then we read this text. So they all ate and were filled and 12 baskets of leftover fragments were taken up by them. What was not enough became more than enough. And God made much out of nothing, amen? amen? This is who God is. This is not what he does. This is the very nature of who he is. And it's what God has laid on my heart for you this morning to remind all of us today. And I wanna just shift gears a little bit and then I'm gonna come back to the story and what that might mean for you and I in our day-to-day -day lives. But, but some years ago, I read a book by Stephen Covey called Seven Habits of Highly Effective People. Anyone read that book? There we go, hey, look at you smart people, okay. Um, the South African people are just, they, when I ask them that, they just look at me. And there are some South Africans watching, hey, hi, mom. Um, <laughs> at least we know one person's watching, okay. But, but he wrote this book, Seven Habits of Highly Effective People, and in the book he says one of the most universal patterns was that effective people had a worldview of abundance. Say abundance. Sadly, Kobe says that much of the world has the opposite worldview, a worldview of scarcity. And I wanna describe the difference between the two. Uh, apparently you tend to get these worldviews very young and they don't tend to change too easily, but they underlie almost everything we say and do. If you have a worldview of scarcity, you have to protect what you have. There's never enough to go around and it's sort of a competitive way of looking at the world, right? But it always moves towards anxiety, towards consumerism, towards possessiveness, because you can't lose. The worldview of scarcity, it's inherently insecure and grabbing, and I'm afraid it's infected much of our world today. Andrew and the disciples in this story represent the worldview of scarcity. There are only five loaves, there are only two fish, and Andrew actually says that line, what good are these amongst so many? Jesus, there isn't enough. There isn't enough land, there isn't enough healthcare, there isn't enough water, money, housing, so you gotta fight for it. It's a dog-eat-dog -dog world, ever heard that? This is the worldview of scarcity. We all want something, but there's never quite enough. 
And Stephen Covey says, there's another worldview and sooner or later we have to choose it because it doesn't come naturally to our, to our souls. It doesn't come naturally, but I'm convinced it is very close to the worldview of the gospel of Jesus Christ. It's the worldview of abundance. A world that says, there's a big world out there, and, there's, and yes, I've got ch challenges, and yes, I've got problems, and yes, I'm struggling, but there's a lot of options, a lot of opportunities, a lot of choices, and there's always another creative way to look at it, right? But let's be honest with ourselves. How many of us live in that space? I know I don't always, all the time. Most of the time, people are afraid, afraid that it's not gonna be enough, Afraid that I'm gonna miss out and we don't take advantage of the levels of opportunity that are available to us, that life offers us. And I get it, I get it because here's the thing, if you are dependent upon a finite source, if you only have, as, as all of us do, a limited amount of money, a limited amount of time, a limited intellect, of course it's easy to look at life through a scarcity worldview. This is how our economy works, this is how politics work, this is how most of our world functions. You see, having an abundance mindset depends, this is so important, it depends upon recognizing that we are in touch with an infinite source. Because if you've never made contact with an infinite source, of course you'll be stingy. Of course you'll be, you'll guard the little that you have and hoard what you have. But Jesus comes along and shows us a different way to be, a different way to live. And in this story, like many others in scriptures, he represents the worldview of abundance. In fact, in every one of the multiplication stories, and we're gonna be exploring those over the next few weeks, I hope you'll come back. But in every one of those stories, there is always the making of much out of little, and there is always left over. There is always more than enough. Why? Because this is the only way, the only possible message of the gospel, that our heavenly Father has enough. More than enough. And if we can just learn to trust Him, if we can just learn to be more creative, if we can be a little more imaginative, if we can be a little less selfish. Someone said poverty exists not because we cannot feed the poor, but because we cannot satisfy the rich. A saint always knows that there is more than enough to meet our need, but not enough to meet our greed. Only a personal experience of an unconditional, unearned, and infinite love and forgiveness can move us from the normal worldview of scarcity to the divine worldview of infinite abundance. But when we do that, when we do that, that's when the doors of mercy blow open. That's when we begin, begin to understand the scale-breaking nature of the gospel, amen? So if you weren't born as most of us weren't with a natural worldview of abundance, maybe it's something we have to choose. Maybe it's something we have to ask for. Maybe it's something we will only ever fully experience when we learn to draw upon and lean into an infinite source, amen? If you get nothing, I mean, that is really what this message, what this whole series is about. If you get nothing else out of my message today, just get this, that we serve, that we belong to, that we are children of an infinite God, the God of more than enough, we sung it earlier, Ephesians 3. Now unto him who is able to do exceedingly, abundantly, above all that we ask or think according to the power that works in us, to him be the glory in the church by Jesus Christ through all generations, forever and ever. Amen. 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 Pfft, who cares? Okay. <laughs> I can do the whole American like amen or whatever. I don't know. But... <laughs> <laughs> Some of the elders are looking at me like, what have we done? Um, <laughs> too late now, guys. Okay. Um, God has and God is more than enough. For the challenge you're facing, for the diagnosis you just got, for the doubts you're wrestling with, for the relationship you're struggling with, he doesn't just have bread, he is the bread of life. And let me tell you, I know I haven't been here long, and I know I still have so much to learn and to figure out about you and about your lives, about America, about Aurora, about Eastern Hills, but I'll tell you, the people of Aurora are hungry. <laughs> they are desperate, not for church, not for, for pretense, but for Jesus, for a real encounter with the living God, with the bread of life, 
who is the only one who can ever satisfy the hunger that you and I have inside. And guys, I wanna give my life to that. Uh, We did not move our whole family and move across the world to play church games, to shuffle Christians around, you know, and talk about our ecclesiology and, you know, why is the the smoke machine and the... uh, (laughs) Come on. I came to reach people who don't know him and who by the grace of God, I believe we will see many people, hungry people, find satisfaction here, not in e-hills, not in my preaching, but in Jesus. And you know why that's such good news? Because it takes all the pressure off us. <laughs> because I don't have to be Jesus, thank God. And you don't have to be Jesus. We don't have to be Jesus. We just have to be like that little boy bringing his lunch to Jesus. To the one who doesn't just multiply bread, but the one who is bread. And so if I had to sum my message up this morning in one sentence, it would be this. Be the boy. Be the boy. You know, when I woke up uh, this morning, or girl, let's be inclusive. Here. Okay. <laughs> my wife's watching. Okay. Um, you know, when I woke up on Monday morning, my, uh, my first day here at E Hills, I was so nervous. And I woke up super early. It was still super dark. And, and my plan was to get uh, to go to Legends Coffee for like just an hour before just to kind of get my head in the game and pray and kind of, you know, pray to God. And, and then I looked out my window. <laughs> <laughs> and there was this white stuff on the ground. And I don't know what it was. I was like, God, is this manna from heaven? I mean, what is it? Turns out it wasn't. It's called snow. And South Africans, don't, we don't know what snow is, okay? And I was like, okay, you know, what am I gonna do? I had to learn very quickly how to shovel my driveway. I'm 42 years old. The first time I've ever done that. And my wife was inside filming through the window, <laughs> shouting orders, you know. And I was doing it all wrong. I was throwing it into the window. It was going back in my face. I was like, this is terrible. What have we done? Um, anyway, <laughs> and thank you for all the comments on Instagram for the way that you, that I didn't do it right. Okay, I got it. But anyway, that morning when I got out of bed, I was, it was still dark and I kissed Jess goodbye and she whispered in my ear. She said, Tom, you've got this. And I know, very sweet. She's an amazing person. I hope you get to meet her, but... And she was just trying to be polite. (laughs) Because even as she said it, it was like God whispered in my ear. No, you don't. (laughs) And God used that moment and used Jess's voice. It's so funny how God's voice and my wife's voice is often very similar. But um, (laughs) he used that moment to remind me, to remind you today of this truth. You don't have what it takes. You know that, right? You don't have what it takes to be the parent to that kid. You don't have what it takes to be the sister that she needs. You don't don't have what it takes to be the employee or the student. You fill in the blank. You don't have what it takes, but Jesus does. That's the point. And in our weakness and in our brokenness and our frailty, he is made strong. And with him, then of course, all things are possible. Amen? Amen. And so, and let me just say, that was the first time in 18 years of marriage that I've ever disagreed with my wife, okay? (laughs) <laughs> she's laughing because it's like more like 18 minutes okay but here's my point my responsibility your responsibility is not to feed the 5,000 that's Jesus's job my responsibility your responsibility is to simply bring what you have that's my first kind of point I want to give you three real quick points real practical applications for you this week from this story that you can apply into your life that can move us from scarcity to abundance. And that's the first one. Bring what you have. In in one version of the story, Jesus says to Philip, one of the other disciples, he says, Philip, go and find out. In other words, go find out what we have to feed these people. What do you have? In other words, can I say this? What gifts do you have? What passion do you have? What resources do you have? What time do you have? You may not have much, but we all have something that God can use, right? And Jesus says, stop focusing on what you think you need. (laughs) Because Philip, you see, Philip, he had a spreadsheet out and he worked it out. He said, Jesus, this is gonna cost 200 denarius. That's eight months wages to feed all these people. But Jesus is like, well, I didn't ask you how many wages. I didn't ask how much we need. I asked how much you have. 
Nothing good is gonna flow through our lives while we stay focused on what we lack. And let me tell you, I'm pretty good at telling God what I lack. I, I, can, I can tell you everything I'm bad at. I can tell you every reason why God shouldn't use me, why I shouldn't be here today. I can show you every wrinkle and blemish and spot. But Jesus says, stop focusing on what you need and start focusing on what you already have. What have I already given to you? Is this making sense? So this week, E-Hills, think about what you have and then bring it. Is it time? Is it presence? Is it whatever it is? Hey, Tom, you know, I'm real busy. I don't have much time. Well, I, I usually say, well, how much time you got? You got five minutes? Well, just spend five minutes every day talking to Jesus. <laughs> I mean, we're working through as a church, as a, as a team, through the book of Psalms, the, uh, Psalms in a year. And honestly, download the reading plan. It takes literally no more than five minutes a day. But see what God does. See how Jesus multiplies that. You got money? Not much. That's okay. It's not about the amount. It's about what you do with the amount. Do you get it? No matter how big or how small, we all have something we can bring to Jesus and God will never scorn what we bring. He welcomes it, no matter how big, no matter how small. So before I move on to point two, let me say this. And it may sound like a contradiction, but it's not. You have what you need right now to accomplish what God has called you to do, but not in your own strength, only in His. You gotta bring it to Him for the miracle to happen. Which leads me to point two, place it in the hands of Jesus. And this for me is more than just bringing it to Jesus. For me, putting it in Jesus' hands, it's, a, it's, about, it's about trust, it's about surrender. Say surrender. surrender. I mean, that's an easy word to say. <laughs> it's a hard word to live out, right? Because let's be honest, there's an Andrew and there's a Philip inside of every single one of us trying to work it out with the spreadsheet out, trying to find out if there's enough, thinking if I don't do this, well, who will? Any fellow control freaks in the room? Right, yeah, there we go. Putting it in Jesus' hands involves faith and obedience. I wanna talk about that next week, but it means we don't just say we trust God, but we actually trust Him. Like, do I actually trust God to be my provider or am I hustling? <laughs> Do I actually trust that he's directing my steps or am I just doing it in my own strength and bashing down the doors and asking God to multiply what I've already done, trying to multiply bread in my own hands? You know, the disciples found out how many they had by counting, five loaves, two fish, but they didn't find out how much it was until they put it in the hands of Jesus. Some of you are thinking, you're thinking how many, but God wants to show you how much. And there's a big difference. I mean, you can count the dollars in your account, how many, but God wants to show you how much, how much he can bless you, how much he has in store for you, far beyond the amounts in an account. But you just simply can't find that out by calculation. You have to find that out by faith. Amen? See, Jesus was testing Philip. He wanted to find out if Philip knew where to go because here's the deal. If you know where to go, it will always be enough. You'll never run out if you know who to go to. But if you don't know where to go, then what we do is, what you and I do, is that we try to meet our needs in ways that ultimately will hurt us in the end. So place it in Jesus' hands. Whatever that is for you, I don't know what you're dealing with, I don't know what you're struggling with, I don't know what you're asking for, but place it in His hands. That challenge, that opportunity, that gift, that talent, that worry, that passion, that relationship, that dream, place it in His hands and watch what happens next. Because what happens next is actually my favorite part of the story. Because what's so amazing, and I never really saw this before, even though I've read this passage so many times, is that I realized that the multiplication actually never happened in the hands of Jesus. It happened in the hands of the disciples. Isn't that amazing? I mean, Jesus blessed it. Jesus broke it. But when something is blessed by God, in His grace, God allows us to experience that multiplication of the blessing in our hands in our homes, in our relationships, in our finances, in our mental health. And so be encouraged today because maybe you've come through those doors today and you feel like all I got is two fish and five loaves. But I'm here to remind you, little is much when God is in it. Okay, final point. Embrace the broken pieces. This is probably the hardest one for me. 
Because none of us like to be broken. None of us like to go through painful experiences, painful seasons, right? But here's the truth. When we have come to the end of ourselves, that is so often the beginning of grace. Bread that has not been broken is not easily shared. Glenn Packiam writes it so well, he says this, we are broken by our frailty, our failure, and by the fallenness of this world. But when you place your brokenness in the hands of Jesus, he can turn brokenness into openness. Your brokenness can open you up to the grace of God, and your brokenness can open you up to others. The church is not made up of people who have something to give and people who have nothing or need something. The church is not about people who have their lives together and those who are broken. The church is a community of mutuality and vulnerability, a place where our brokenness becomes a way to open our lives up to one another and to allow God to meet us with his grace. And there's that line, after all, bread that has not been broken cannot be shared. Craig Rochelle puts it another way. He says, life's greatest breakings can often lead to God's greatest blessings. I wish it wasn't that way, but it is. And so let us embrace the brokenness in our lives, the times we have failed, the times we lost our temper, the times we've messed up, gotten it wrong, and not hiding it, not sweeping it under the rug, just just a vulnerability and a confessing. There's power in confession, knowing and trusting that God is in the business of using and restoring and redeeming our brokenness for his glory. In fact, it's where he does his greatest work. So E. Hills, here's the challenge. Bring what you have, place it in the hands of Jesus and embrace the broken pieces. Amen? Let me close with this. Band are so sneaky around here, they just come on up like. (laughs) God is using every need in your life right now. Remember the disciples were hungry too. They needed to eat too. And Jesus used the need they didn't even wanna meet to meet the need they had. That's how good God is. And I'll say it again. The people of Aurora are hungry. When I stand out here on the back of this building and I look out over the the Truman suburb, Truman land, we call it, the suburbs of America, I see fields ripe for the harvest. I see families in need. I see people desperate for hope, for purpose, for meaning beyond themselves. And I see opportunity to be salt and light, hands and feet. And we, E Hills, we get to be the people who point, you can point people to the one who doesn't just have bread, but can multiply bread, who is the bread of life, who doesn't just have enough, but who is enough. And here's my promise to you, here's my promise. And I wanted to say it on the very first day I had the privilege of standing on this stage, is that this church will always be a Jesus church. It'll always be a Jesus church because it's never been about us. And I don't know the whole story and I don't know all the history and some of you do, but I know this, this church was never built by a person. Not Sean, not Phil, as grateful as I am for those people and and not me and and maybe Sonia because Sonia, unbelievable. Jesus and Sonia, they built this place. But (laughs) it's built by Jesus. I'm not enough unless you come because Jesus is more than enough. And unless he builds this house, we who labor, labor in vain. And so because of Jesus, I wanna say to you, you don't have to go find peace, it's already yours. You don't have to become righteous, you already are in Christ. You don't have to find a reason to rejoice, you've already got one. You don't have to be Jesus, you just have to be the boy. Bring your loaves, bring your fishes, because in God's economy, an abundance economy, a tiny rock can make a giant fall, can take down a nation. Five loaves can feed 5,000. And E Hills Church, there is more inside of you, there is more around you, and there is more for you than you dared to imagine. And I believe it. And you are not a task, and you are not a function, you're not a position, you are a child of God with infinite value and worth, which means you have an inheritance beyond your wildest dreams. 
And some of you, some of you might have just forgotten that. And I pray that by the power of His Holy Spirit, that dream would be awoken in your heart again today because God has a plan for your life. And I don't care what you've done or haven't done or how good you've been or how bad you've been because it's not based on our performance. It's based on who God is. And He is a good, good Father. And so you may feel like you're not enough or there's never enough, but God told me to tell you today, He is more than enough. Let's stand to our feet. We're gonna sing, we're gonna worship. And I wanna pray Ephesians 3 over you again. And so bow your heads, close your eyes. You wanna put your hands out like this just as a way of saying, I wanna receive from God. Now to Him who is able to do exceedingly, abundantly, above all that we ask or think according to the power that works in us. To Him be the glory in the church by Jesus Christ to all generations forever and ever. Amen.